Hello, and welcome to today's lecture forming part of the IHF medical webinar series. My name is Courtney Gayen, and I am your moderator this afternoon. We have three translation languages available today, French, Spanish, and Arabic. You can find these at the bottom of your screen if you are joining us on Zoom by clicking the globe icon marked interpretation and selecting the label for your language. This first IHF medical webinar series is part of the virtual academy introduced this year by the IHF to facilitate global online learning. All of this falls under the umbrella of the IHF Education Center, which you can access at ihfeducation.ihf.info. Today's lecture is presented by Professor Greta Miklebus, Professor of Rehabilitation and Prevention at Oslo Sports Trauma Research Center at the Norwegian School of Sports Sciences, and focuses on prevention and rehabilitation of knee and shoulder injuries. As always, please feel free to ask questions throughout the lecture and we will do a short Q&A session at the end. And also please note this is being recorded so you will be able to access it later on the IHF Education Center as well as on the IHF Facebook page. So welcome Professor, we are ready to begin when you are. Thank you very much and uh, thank you for inviting me to have this uh, presentation about two of my favorite topics, um, especially just talking about handball is the, the best I can do. So uh, uh, today the, the topic will be, uh, I will first go through the research model that we use when we are talking about both rehabilitation and prevention. Uh, I will mainly talk about risk factors for ACL injuries and the injury mechanisms and how they actually happen. I will quite shortly go through an ACL prevention program. And then I change focus to rehabilitation of knee injuries and return to play guidelines and challenges after, um, um, for example, a, a reconstruction of an ACL injury. Then I will uh, change uh, position and uh, talk about shoulder injury prevention. And, uh, and finally talk about the implementation challenges and and tell you about where you can find a lot of this knowledge uh, about uh, both, especially prevention of injuries uh, in our uh, fitoplay.org website and an app called Get Set. So first, uh, how do we do it when we are talking about uh, sports injury research? Well, first we need to know the magnitude of the problem. So if we are talking about ACL injuries, we need to know the number, how many people, how many handball players ruptures their ACL um, every season. Uh, when we have that numbers, we need to know the causes. Why do they happen? And what are the risk factors for getting an ACL injury? And based on that knowledge, we will probably have an idea of how we can prevent the, the injury. And then we test that, uh, that uh, idea or the exercises, for example, and then count the number of injuries again. So that's a normal way of doing uh, this, um, this uh, uh, research. So first, first I will start about prevent, prevention of knee injuries. And when we look at this um, video, this is Norway playing against uh, France couple of years ago, when you see this, you all know how handball is, it's so quick. There's a lot of cutting movement, turning, uh, one leg landing, and, uh, and nice goals, as you see here. So nothing wrong happened. Then just see here, this is the same match. Look at the number 22. Uh, she's now doing a normal cutting movement in handball that we see they do it thousands of, uh, thousands of times during um, during a season, and it's uh, and what we know is that it's a typical way of rupturing an ACL in uh, ACL uh, in handball, and uh, you will get it from another angle. This is Nora Merck. Probably you could recommend you can see her, and and you look at this position that she put her leg on. It's a really wide cutting movement, which it's not favorable for the ACL. So this uh, national team player, she ruptured her ACL. She has gone through uh, rehab and is 
come back now. Uh, but just to tell you more about how we have attacked the ACL problem in, in Norway. Uh, back in 2000, we, know, we knew that at every team, there were one player per team ruptured the ACL every year. So in a season, there could be 12 ACL injuries, uh, which was a really big problem in Norway. And I know it's more or less the same numbers in, in other countries, but we really did uh, precise counting of the numbers and how they uh, ruptured their ACL. And we also know that there is really a sex difference in relation to ACL injuries. There's a five to one distribution. So only one ma male and five times higher risk for a female to get an ACL injury. Uh, playing matches is also important to keep in mind because there is a 30 times higher risk in matches compared to training sessions. And I think that is numbers that we we should keep in mind in relation to how many matches every player is playing in the season. And I know that has been a, a, a large discussion among players at top level that they have too many matches each season. In addition, we know that the ACL injuries are mostly non-contact injuries. So it's not tangible as a contact sport, which is a problem, but there are, they are mostly non-contact. If we compare that with the with uh, another popular sport, soccer or football, like we call it, the sex distribution is three to one. So there are more equal numbers, and in in, in football we see both contact and non-contact ACL injuries. Uh, what about the, the playing position? Does that is that important to know something about and? What we see is that the back players have the highest risk of getting an ACL injury compared to wing, line, and the goalies. Uh, injury mechanisms. Look at this left side. Uh, this is again a typical cutting movement. The player have a wide stance when, when she do the cutting movement and try to go to the, to the left. And there the ACL is ruptured. And and uh, in studies we have done in Norway, 60% of the ACL injuries happens in a cutting movement among female athletes. While the one leg landing, which you can see on the next slide, is another large uh, amount of, uh, of uh, injuries happened in, in a one leg landing. So these are two injury mechanisms that we have to keep in mind if we want to make a prevention program. So we have also asked ourselves, how does these, um, these injuries actually occur? When does it occur regarding when you are looking at, at uh, the foot position, the timing of the, the movements? And we have done a large study on that. We had 10 actual non-contact ACL injury videos which was filmed with at least two camera angles. This, these videos were all from female athletes at top level in handball uh, and basketball. And they all uh, happened in game situations. Seven cutting and three one landing, landing situations. And by uh, really analyzing these videos uh, precisely by anim having an animation and in this video, they put a skeleton model into every frame to get really more, to get precise um, movement patterns. Uh, and, and that should give us the possibility to, to know better when the injury occurred. So when we had uh, several uh, video angles from this injury situation, we put a skeleton into the, the, the model and here you can see the movements uh, for this person after the initial contact of the foot and the cutting movement. And when we summed up those 10, um, 10 videos and the 10 situations, we found a consistent result among the 10 injury cases. Um, the, the gray line or the black, black line 
is the median and the confidence interval is in the, the light gray. So we found that there came a sudden valgus increase, which reached 12 degrees in, in 40 milliseconds after initial contact. So 40 milliseconds after you have put your leg on the floor, then we saw the sudden valgus increase. So that in the ACL ruptured at that time. We also get an internal rotation increased by eight degrees in 40 milliseconds and also an increase of the peak vertical ground reactions force. So uh, we could conclude that injury takes place within 40 milliseconds after initial contact and the injury mechanisms involves valgus and internal tibial rotation. And why is this important to know? Well, uh, since the ACL ruptures as quick as 40 milliseconds after initial contact, the muscles that should protect you from having this valgus uh, motion should be pre-activated. And that means that you have to do exercises that pre-activate the muscles. So we concluded the injury occurs at 40 milliseconds after initial contact. When we had the numbers, uh, the high numbers of ACL injuries in uh, Norwegian handball, we wanted to test if it was possible to prevent the ACL injuries. And we wanted to assess the effects of a sort of balanced uh, strength uh, neuromuscular training program on the incidence of ACL injuries in female uh, handball players. And we followed 60 teams or 950 female players for three years to have control of the number of ACL injuries in Norwegian handball. Here you see some of the exercises. Uh, and here you see some of the exercises. Um, one leg balance on a balance mat, focusing on hip knee control. And we talked a lot about um, the knee over toe positioning. Uh, so they were working a lot of balance exercises, jumping exercises like here and try to focus on two leg landings and not and a smaller cutting movement. So all the time, the knee over toe positioning was, uh, was uh, a phrase that the players really learned, try to have the knee over toe positioning or the hip knee toe in line. Um, here you see some more exercises. We know that some of the uh, injuries happens after a perturbation or a push like that. And then they need to, to try to land on two legs instead of, of um, one leg as much, much as possible. So hip control, um, knee control, ankle control, and try to punch the ball on a bubble board with closed eyes, which is quite difficult. Again, training two leg landings, trying to have a, a more narrow um, cutting movement. That was uh, exercises that they were doing um, three times a week in, a, in the pre-season period. And then they did it once a week during the season. So what happened after we had done this for two years? So the first, uh, first um, if you see, on the y-axis, it's the number of ACL injuries among those 950 players. So the control season, which were here, we had 28 ACL injuries. Then it was, we introduced the training program or the exercise program, and it was reduced down to 17 after two years. When we looked at the numbers, it was a non-significant number. Uh, when we looked at both the elite first and the second division. But when we just analyzed the numbers from, for, for the elite athletes, we found that those elite athletes who did not do this program had a 16 times higher risk of an ACL injury uh, compared to those uh, who did it. So doing the program works. You can prevent ACL injuries 
uh, among female uh, handball players. Or maybe more precisely, you could um, reduce the risk of getting an injury. So it's important to keep that, that in mind. And there have been several studies. This is a study by uh, Ochenbach in 2018. And uh, they had the, a training program including hamstring strength, single leg jumps. They were training jump and landings and sing, single leg balance. And they concluded with that neuromuscular training prevents knee injuries. And it should be implemented in regular routine as well as in coach education. In uh, some years after the ACL prevention study, we did um, a randomized control st study among youth athletes, both girls and boys. And this was uh, the intervention group did a 15 to 20 minute training program, including running exercises, technique training, balance training and strength and plyometric exercises. And uh, the balance exercises you could see on the wobble board. They were also practicing a more narrow cutting movement and a two leg landings after jump shots, for example. And to down to the right, they were doing the Nordic uh, hamstrings uh, exercise. And uh, after following the control uh, group and the training group, and this was uh, about 1,000 players in each group, we saw that it was an uh, a, a, almost a 50% reduced risk of getting both ankle and knee injuries among the young players who did this more uh, standard, standardized uh, warm-up program compared to normal warm-up, uh, which every team had their own way of doing it. And when we looked at the knee ligament injuries, there were 10 in the control group and three in the intervention group. So this warm-up program really worked with an 80% reduction of serious knee injuries. So here you can see the, the, the Norwegian ham, female handball players again. Now, while you can see the incidence or the number of injuries per team per season on the y-axis here. So in the control season in 1998-99, there were about half a, 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 a half a, a injury per team per season. When we looked at both elite first and second division. And then you see in green, the, the number went down during the intervention. Then we stopped the intervention. Uh, I was actually writing my PhD, but we've continued to follow the teams or counting the number of ACL, ACL injuries. And what we saw here, it was an increased number of ACL injuries the next years. So at that point, we found out that we had to do some more. So we introduced um, coach educational courses. So we traveled around Norway uh, and, and had courses for the, the coaches uh, and tried to teach them how to prevent these injuries. And uh, in addition, and we saw that it was a good reduction here uh, and we followed them for four more years. And what you see here, we really had a, a large reduction in ACL injuries. Uh, and at this, this time, we also had uh, a, a new website, which is called Free of Injury in English, or yeah, it's called the Free Norwegian. So we actually uh, managed to, uh, to reduce the number of ACL injuries in Norwegian female handball by 50%, which is extremely important for the individual and of course also for the for the, um, the teams, because we can avoid um, all the economical problems and of course all the personal problems and trouble they have with that severe injury. So if we put it in a clinical relevance, as I showed you uh, previous, ACL injuries in 2000, 12 injuries or one player per team uh, now or in 2014, six injuries or a half player per team. So a 50% reduction is probably something that people can listen to and hopefully do uh, the stuff we are, are, are doing with, with our players. 
So if we should sum up the ACL prevention, what works? Well, neuromuscular training, technique training, try to have a two leg landings, practice two leg landings early when they start uh, playing handball. Um, more narrow cutting movement and coordination balance exercises and strength and running exercises and jumping exercises plyometrics. So doing this regularly, uh, for example, as a warm up, gives almost a 50% re risk reduction. So what now? How is the numbers right now? This is, uh, I apologize for a busy slide and some of, some of the numbers are in Norwegian, but this is the incidence of reconstructed ACL injuries in Norway from 2005, 10 and 15, both men and women. And be aware of this is all kinds of athletes and non-athletes. This is people who have got an ACL uh, reconstruction. But the interesting thing here is to look at the age group. If you look at the age group 10 to 19, which you see here, and the three upper lines, they show an increased increase of ACL reconstruction among female young athletes. And that is something that we see in Norway as well, that, uh, that a lot of young girls rupture the ACL early. And we have to think about why does that happen? And, and, uh, and I think we need to keep in mind the number of matches that young athletes, young female athletes, and also boys uh, play. So prevention program can reduce the risk with 50%, but implementation is the key factor. And when I talk to the coaches, he said, what's in it for us or for me? Well, I think you will have available players. They will be 100% ready for training and matches and they, a healthy athlete will improve the team performance. And of course, we need to identify barriers and misbeliefs and the resistance the, the coaches have to change. And of course, take, talk with them and acknowledge their expertise and facilitate reflection and discussions and provide facts about best practice together with the coaches. So what about the players? What's in it for me? Well, they can train and play matches. They are more or less 100% ready to perform if they keep healthy. They will develop as a player and have a longer and better career. But of course, we need to talk with the players uh, and identify the barriers through their own reflections and facilitate discussions and provide facts about best practice together with the players. But we need to have the coach and athlete on our team. They need to be interested in doing prevention and perform it and, and, and have time for implementing it. And it's, it's about 10, 15 minutes, three times a week. So take home regarding this, never mus muscular training works, use it. Maybe think about restriction on number of matches for the, the best players who are attending several teams. Try be aware of the number of matches. Monitor the workload, how much do they train and practice in total. And you need to have coach and player education and cooperation. And think about how we can implement the, this knowledge as best as we can. So I just want to check the time. So I, then we go to re rehabilitation and return to sport after severe knee injuries. And uh, how do we do that? Well, first of all, it's important with information uh, after a severe knee injury, both the athlete, parents and coach need to get information and we need to follow the patient for six to 12 months. And it's, of course, it's dependent on age and level of play, and we need to assess the function. We need to take the mental readiness um, into account and also have patience. It takes time to come back after a serious um, knee injury. And we have a rehabilitation algorithm, uh, which 
are in different phases. First, we in the beginning, it's important to get a better range of motion or get a normal range of motion. Then we are thinking more about motor control and then muscle strength, which of course the main goal is to, for, for most of the athletes to go back and play at the same level or maybe better than before. And, the, and this takes time. So, so there are different milestones on the way to, to, to go back. This is a, just an exercise progression model, which Blanket and Glasgow have presented in 2014, which you can find the article and go into it. But it just shows that you start with, with uh, when you start uh, hop, hopping, you have to go start very slowly with forward motion before you jump higher, before you go back and forth. So the, it's a way of structuring the way um, the exercises and what kind of exercises you include in the in the rehabilitation. But may, maybe the first milestone for first athlete is to get the straight leg to, to try to to get a full extension. So it's possible to get rid of the crutches. And uh, that is important to use a lot of time on get a, the fluid away and get contact with the vastus medialis and the quadriceps uh, muscles, so you are able to get rid of the crutches. Uh, just one typical, very simple exercise that you could start way to, to facilitate, to have full extension on when you're doing this, uh, this uh, exercise, just to, to, you must ma manage to have a straight knee when you do that, because if you go with flex knee, there will be no uh, no good uh, walking, and then you have really need to have the crutches. So, training full extension is important. You need to have adequate loading, alignment, and terminal knee extension, because when you do, you can load and have control in the terminal knee extension that initiate running. So, having a straight knee here is important. And then you can uh, increase uh, the difficulty on the, um, uh, this uh, model and put in more, uh, more um, comprehensive exercises. Um, when we talking about uh, rehabilitation, we often talk about range of motion, motor control and muscle strength. But I think it's important to keep in mind the psychological part to, to build confidence, to understand progress, to educate the athlete, maybe the parents and the coaches, master progression, help them to, to be independent, self-preservation and communication. That's really important uh, psychological part. And the X factor, exercise prescription, weighting of tasks to, 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 to uh, choose what is important at the differ different stages of the rehabilitation and prioritize focus and optimize physiological efficacy. And this you will find in Bruckner and Kahn's uh, great book from 2017. So when we are working with the athletes, it's important to be aware of full straight knees. So they are managed to get a full, ex uh, full um, extension of the knee. And you see here, this is not good enough. Get, taking the steps with um, some flexion and then really need to, to, to control both legs and see if they manage to have a full extension. Um, doing strength, uh, now leg extension, you could do quite early, but you see it's not full range of motion, but activating the quadriceps quite early after a, a reconstruction uh, by just doing almost no, no, no um, weight on it, just really easy and doing a small, small activation exercise. Uh, we need to focus on function. So here you can see, you probably can recognize Nora Merck after her reconstruction, having, having taken weight and have control, but this is quite early. So she, she had some help as you can see. Uh, later on, you could do Jumping, uh, jumping, two leg, one leg, and you can see she, 
she's not uh, it's not the same control on both legs but it's nice training and here you slowly start to do what later on could be a cutting movement but trying to move in different directions is important here you can include uh, the um, more strength strength uh, training for your um, your uh, torso which is important when you are a handball player to, to get all the body with you so this is just some examples that uh, athletes at the olympic center are using uh, for our handball players and then uh, you see again the progression model you can increase and put uh, more difficult parts into it with jumping and uh, hurdles like you see here um, during the rehab uh, period. So uh, one thing that I know that uh, I got some slides from Howard Moxness, which is uh, working a lot with ACL patients uh, this time. And um, what he do with his uh, top athletes, he asked the, every athlete to write down a comeback list. What what it's what is important for them in defense action and what is important in the attacking actions and, and get them to put uh, write it down uh, on paper what do you have to start with it's first doing some um, movements uh, direction directions first without any resistance or a, or a partner and then you have with the resistance then you are dueling play and all, and then later on, you could have um, uh, attacking phase and stopping, turning back, and all this stuff. And you you could make the athletes to make this comeback list for both defense actions and attack action. This is in Norwegian uh, the details here, but you probably understand what I mean. So they need to write down themselves what's important, and then they try and follow that that uh, list uh, and and should feel confident that they are doing all these exercises on a good matter before they can go further. Here you can see one, uh, one um, exercises, one exercise that Nordam Merck was, was working on, trying to have control in this position, going back. And, and the team was, the whole team was doing other stuff, but she was doing practicing special movements which was important for her uh, in her return phase then she could continue and and shoot which is probably what she likes best here you see one leg squat drawing and then ending with a jump shot but you combine all these uh, different uh, exercises training to end up in something that she really needs. And there she sees she has a two leg landing with flexed knee. Then you can, can have training with a partner and here is the defense part um, exercise. And uh, the, she's really have a, a good, good workout for her legs. And, and then you can you could ask, is it possible to come back after an ACL injury and at that level? And for those of you who follow the European Championship uh, going on right now, uh, Nora is playing really well, and uh, but it has taken time. Uh, so, uh, but she's playing good and we are happy for that. So what about the return to sport continuum? Okay, it's first about return to participation then you return to sport and then you return to, to performance. And during this phase, the clinical assessment is important when you do the rehab. There should be no um, effusion. That's so important. You are not going to train hard with effusion. So it's, it's important to, uh, to get rid of that. And we have all this test for uh, ACL, Lachman, pivot shift, and we test the medial and lateral stability, joint line palpation, and of course the active extension leg test, which you see, you, you, you can lift your, your, uh, your leg. Uh, 
Uh, questioner, which is, I think it's good to use, is the ACL return to sport injury scale, ACL RSC. It's 12 questions about confidence, emotions, risk appraisal. Um, it's the best return to, to, to play predictor after ACL reconstruction. So it's a really good questionnaire and it's in many, translated into many different uh, languages. Confidence, uh, the questions uh, the athlete should answer, are you confident about your ability to perform well at your sport? And they score in all of these questions. Are you nervous about playing your sport? Do you think you are likely to re-injure your knee by participating in your sport? And when you are uh, answering this, you will get a score. And I think that will, um, if you have a low score, you, you could see that maybe the athlete is not ready to go back yet but it could be done several times during the rehab. And then you have all these test batteries, which is used. You have the cool knee survey, you have jumping exercises, you have uh, strengthening um, tests, and, uh, and then you have the physical performance test, which is important uh, in the return to play decision. I don't want to use so much time on this, but this is a, uh, three steps, assessment of health risk, assessment of activity risk, and assessment of risk tolerance, because do you toler tolerate that you have some risk by going back? So uh, I think you could look more closely to this later. Um, and I also think it's important to keep in mind that actually there's a time frame which is important. Usually we talk about uh, not uh, following a time frame in the rehabilitation, but there are two studies that have shown that it could be possible to, to have a, a time in, in mind when we are talking about return to level one sport, because in this one of these studies from Grindem and co-workers, uh, they found that the return to level one sport, which is pivoting sport like handball, should be delayed until at least nine months have passed from surgery and the patient has regained quadriceps strength comparable to the uninjured side. So at minimum nine months. Uh, in a study from uh, Qatar, they uh, found that meeting six specific objective discharge criteria before return to sport after ACL reconstruction rehabilitation was associated with approximately one quarter risk of the risk of ACL rupture. So going through um, criteria and, and, uh, and meet them is important to avoid a new ACL injury. And just as an example from uh, Hege Grindem's study, for those who return before nine months, 38% of the athletes had a new ACL injury. For those who returned after nine months, only 6% had a new. So to keep that in mind, try to avoid too early return to competition. And again, psychological factors, the psychological readiness, low fear on new injury is important and trust in knee and good knee function is also uh, important to keep in mind. And Arden and co-workers has, has uh, um, written several articles on that subject. So you are not the patient anymore. Now we have to become an athlete again. I think that's an important statement. They need to be safe and trust their knee. And the criteria for uh, return to sport has been muscle strength measurements more than 90% of the opposite side. The single leg hop test should be more than 90% of the opposite side with adequate strategy and quality of the movement. Performing a gradual increase in sport specific training with, without symptoms or fear of, knee, uh, of re injury. And you should also have a full intensity practice for a minimum of four weeks. That is the criteria which is, people are quite uh, agree uh, about. And a muscle strength test uh, for quadriceps, maximum effort with increasing load until failure, and test the highest uh, what? Uh, the traditional hop tests are a single log hop for distance where you test first the 
the, the healthy leg, and then the opposite. And then you just um, measure the distance they jump. And uh, here you can see, uh, and take this one, a triple hop uh, for distance. You can see it here. Then you measure how long can you jump um, three jumps. And you measure the distance uh, and compare uh, both legs. And you can also do the crossover and the six meter time hop test. And here you see a counter movement jump and a one leg on two legs. And measuring how uh, high you can, can um, jump. And the landing should be the same on both legs as the quality is important. Here you have a, a side hop test, 30 seconds. You are not allowed to touch the white line. But it's important to have a benchmark. That that means that this athlete should have done that uh, before when when they before they got the the injury. So this is a test that could be good to have for your players, and then you test them. Use that as a return, uh, one of the return to to sport but criteria, and you just count, count the number of jumps. And a uh, different agility tests are used. Um, let me see if we can start that. Uh, a T test and several other custom tests. And again, here, if you should use that, you should have some tests before injury as well. But this is uh, it's also a nice way to see improvement in 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 um, both movement quality and and time. So return to play advice. It should be taken in a collaborative effort between the trainer, the physio, the surgeon, and the athlete. The timing of return to play should be gradual and based on cons consecutive observations of knee function in sport-specific actions. So if we think a week plan for a high-level athlete going back to their sport, there should be two sport-specific. This is just uh, what, what we use uh, in a way. Two sport specific, two strength uh, sessions, one stability explosive uh, session, and one to two sport specific with ball without a team in addition. Um, and the return to training versus competition. In training, gradual progression in strength, stability, jump, landing, and turns, sport specific movements, and movement confidence. So they have to trust the knee for competition. Maximum one match per week the first three months. The first match should maybe be only 10 minutes. The second maybe 15 to 20 minutes in total. And the third, then you just increase the time you use. You don't put a, a athlete back into time 30 minutes. So uh, for uh, this rehab um, session, Remove effusion, regain full active extension, initiate movement early, make the rehabilitation individualized, not the same type of exercises for everyone. You have to take every athlete as a special case. Make sure you have an active interdisciplinary collaboration for the top athletes. Progression through rehabilitation is guided by functional testing. And the functional tests are important pieces of the return to, to play puzzle. Movement quality is as important as quantity and sport specific prevention programs should be used. And for level one sports, weight minimum, minimum nine months after ACL reconstruction. So then we go to the shoulder and I will shortly go through uh, the, the knowledge about prevention of shoulder injuries, which is not much. Well, there's a lot of situations uh, in handball that you can, can get injured or having a, uh, um, a painful shoulder. And there's a situation where you could have an acute injury, luxations and everything. But uh, there are, um, what we mostly know is that shoulder injuries in handball is overused injuries. Uh, the throwing shoulder is a uh, is something a quote that we we often say, which uh, all people who work with handball players know. We call it throwing shoulder. And what we know about the extent of the problem is that among elite uh, male and female players, there 
most of them or more than half of them have a history of shoulder pain if you ask them. And the point at every, every point, uh, about 35%, 30 to 36% have shoulder pain. For If you go into a team and ask them uh, one day, about 30% 30, 30 would say, I have shoulder pain. While the average prevalence of shoulder pain uh, for shoulder problems is 28%, but for the more severe substantial problems which affect the, the performance and the training volume is 12%. So uh, we asked uh, the Handball Federation and the Handball coaches and players in Norway some years ago and asked them, what do you want us to try to find out? Which part of the body do you have most problems with? And uh, we got the answer, shoulders. There's a lot of painful shoulders among handle players. And what we also know is that they continue to play with the painful shoulder, they don't stop. So it's an overused injury. So uh, what we uh, performed was the randomized control study about uh, uh, with male and female handle players 45 teams and 660 players uh, attended in this uh, randomized study. Uh, and um, we wanted to, we, we made an uh, exercise program trying to uh, control or uh, to get some, um, yeah, to, to, to do something about scapula control, about the strength in external rotation in the shoulder and also the range of motion. So, um, and, and we, we made this exercise program, which was based on risk factor studies and expert recommendations. There are five exercises should be take up around 10 minutes and we made different variations and levels and it should be performed three times per week as part of the warm up, and delivered by coaches and team captains. And, um, so, so, so the intervention group uh, did the exercises that I showed you now. Um, you can see that this is exercises that can, well, it's good for your core, but also for your scapula. We also had external rotation and strength exercises, internal rotation or range of motion, stretching, as you can see below here, and also kinetic chain exercises and thoracic uh, mobility exercises. Um, yeah, a lot of these uh, exercises were pair exercises, so two and two players work together. And um, some of them were quite heavy, but um, they were, were performed, should be performed three times a week. And um, <clears throat> you can see, you probably can recognize a lot of these exercises, working with the uh, external rotational muscles. Uh, in your shoulder and your thoracic uh, mobility. So, uh, and also some perturbation exercises, drop the ball and catch it. Um, and how did this, uh, uh, and, and uh, every, every week they got the question, have you had any difficulties participating in normal training or match due to problems with your throwing shoulder during the past week? And then the, every, every player should answer on this. He also asked if they had to reduce their training volume. If they had the problem, uh, the shoulder had uh, affected the performance during the past week and to what extent they had pain. And then um, they, if they had, uh, in the yellow, you could see um, if they an answered some of these yellow parts, they had uh, a problem. But if they had uh, answered on the high, high scores on sports performance or training, a reduced training volume, it's uh, a substantial uh, shoulder problem. And uh, the results show that um, doing this exercise problem gave a 28% lower probability of reporting shoulder problems among elite handball players in, in, in Norway. And a 22% lower probability of reporting substantial shoulder problems. 
so the 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 training program was effective and as you can see uh, the compliance with the program was not as high as we wanted uh, in mean they they did 1.6 times per week and all those response so we know that as all prevention programs it needs to be completed to have effect so for the coach uh, when we ask them what's in it for us the clinical relevance for the coaches is that you can expect that five players experience a shoulder problem at any time but you can reduce this by three players by completing the program 1.6 times per week and for the players you have a 28 percent lower probability of shoulder problems by completing this program 1.6 times per week which makes you hopefully a better player so uh, this is uh, this is the program or, ex or types of exercises should be implemented as a part of the warm-up in handball and and now i just show you uh, some videos from our website which um, is free for all of you. It's uh, called Fit to Play in, uh, in, uh, in English. So here it's possible to, to, um, to see all the videos, which is part of this, uh, uh, this uh, prevention program. So uh, and we have filmed all the exercises. So again, nice exercise to, to activate the, the back part of your body uh, and external rotation and you can do weight balls. But I also think it's important that you keep in mind the load management when we are talking on high level athletes, but also among young athletes, because a lot of young athletes are training too much. Uh, they are playing too many matches compared to what they do of training. So take care of the young athletes by helping them doing prevent prevention exercises as a normal normal thing not a special thing but uh, prevent prevention is important to enhance their performance and just uh, to end up this with um, this uh, fit to play uh, that I mentioned this is a website um, that you will find uh, exercises for 60 sports and 11 body parts. Um, we have an, an app. Uh, this is the website fit2play.org. So, so you can use that one. And then we have an app which is called Get Set Train Smarter, where all of these you could just uh, choose handle and then you can uh, find all the exercises you want for ankle or knee, uh, shoulder, back. And it's videos uh, of all of these, and they are free uh, accessible. So there are no costs with it. So please uh, give the information to coaches, players, and, and other medical persons around uh, the place. So, um, so as I said, you will find exercise programs for 60 sports and handball is of course one of them. And here are the, the different body parts, shoulder, back, groin, hamstrings, knee, and ankle. And you will see all the videos uh, with the, how we should do it uh, and examples of how we could do it. So uh, please uh, download, download the app and uh, use the website. So uh, with this, I think I um, finalized and uh, just want to, to tell you that try to implement uh, prevention exercises to enhance the performance for the athletes and keep them healthy and make them make it possible for them to play handball their whole life that's much more fun than being injured thank you very much much for listening thank you very much Francesca. so we do have a few questions um so somebody asked about the effect of aerobic exercise underwater to help with reduction in pain and stiffness so they wonder if you can do exercises underwater or in uh, in water. Yeah. Uh, well, we usually use uh, water training as a part of rehab, uh, especially for uh, you could do running in water uh, in Paris, but when you can't 
uh, get uh, weight on your leg, for example. So I think that's a good, uh, a good thing to do together with the normal strength training for the for the body. Um, so uh, absolutely, it's uh, you could put it on, but not just uh, water training. Mm -hmm. um, uh, somebody else asked, why do you think there are more lower limb injuries than upper limb, considering handball is of course, a throwing sport. Mm. I do think that actually there has been, in a way, under-reporting of upper limb injuries because uh, we haven't been good enough to um, have data on the overuse injuries because a lot of the lower limb um, reporting is uh, acute injuries, which we really have good report system for. But for the overuse injuries, which is those you probably continue, you are on your tra training session, you play matches, but you play with reduced performance. So maybe maybe there is not so much uh, difference that we have a feeling of, but now there are questionnaires that can be used. Um, also Sport Trauma Research Center questionnaire for overuse injuries is a really easy and good questionnaire for getting better numbers of overuse injuries. Okay, uh, somebody asked, um, what, what do you have an explanation for uh, why the majority of serious injuries occur in the first minutes of the first and second halves in matches? I'm not sure if uh, may, maybe there are data that that shows that, but actually from the data from ACL injuries, there is I can't see that there happens in the first part of both the. Sometimes it happened, of course, uh, late in the match, but I think they are quite well distributed through the through the match. But of course, if you sit in uh, 15 minutes uh, during the break and maybe haven't played so much in the first part as well, mm. then maybe you're not not ready for getting up. So that could be a, a answer for the second uh, part of the game, but not the first part, because then everybody should have done the same warm up. Yeah. Uh, okay. And uh, somebody just asked, as a curiosity, is this kind of preventative training very common in Norway, in general, or is it just a part of the elite training program? Uh, it's absolutely something that we implement in the younger athletes because, you know, the, for many elite athletes, the, they do it a lot. I think they have been, we are working really hard with that for this for 20 years. But we, we really push forward having the preventing exercises on the young, young athletes. So when they start playing handball, of course, it should be a normal thing to do some of these exercises. It should not be called prevention. It should just be called uh, training, normal hammer training. If you include some of these exercises in your warm up, because they are running, they are throwing in the warm up. So, but you should include some of the exercises that makes your ankle, knee ready for the movements that they are going to use, and also the shoulder. Don't throw only uh, forward, but also backward, and get the rotation and the external rotators better with. So, yes, in Norway we really work hard implementing all of this stuff for the young one. That's the, maybe the most important group. Uh, okay, another one. Um, somebody, uh, someone who's a physio asks, what do you think about the possibility to add medium gluteus specific exercise in ACL prevention programs? Hmm. I, I think that the glutes in general and uh, gluteus medium, the medium glutes is, is really important because if you can't stabilize your hip, you are not stabilizing your knee. So in all of these exercises, uh, when you saw the videos, they were, we were talking a lot about avoid the hip clipping out. So the, the, the glute uh, control, the medius is really important. And of course, then also the core, because if you're not uh, strong and stable in the core, you will also have less stability uh, down your legs. So uh, I think that is really important. All right, that brings us to the end of the questions. And so that we will finish there. Thank you so much, Professor, for your time. This is a very interesting lecture. Thank you. 
And I would just let everyone know we do still have a couple of lectures forming part of this first IHF medical webinar series that are coming up. The dates for those are just to be confirmed. So keep an eye on our website and our social media channels and we will keep you informed about those. So thank you again, Professor, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank and you. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.